run um, Cause For and also the Arts Fundraising and Philanthropy Programme. So really delighted this morning to be sharing some research that is in process around fundraising from um, diverse communities. And I'll explain a little bit more about what we've been doing um, shortly. What has research shown specifically about fundraising from diverse communities and then what next for uh, organisations? And I should say, from Arts Council England's point of view, this is a long-term piece of work. So there'll be lots of different aspects and activities uh, uh, to it. And I'm obviously just sharing an overview today. So we've been researching um, why there's so little research actually, um, or fundraising um, activity on diverse communities. So there's an awful lot internationally, particularly from the States. And I'm gonna share quite a lot of that in the second half of uh, this morning. Um, but in terms of UK um, funding from diaspora communities and different communities, there's actually very little. Um, and we've been wanting to uh, think about uh, different approaches and what will need to be in place to successfully develop those approaches. Um, and one of our arts fundraising fellows said to me that, you know, he was so frustrated because every time um, work he was involved in um, uh, that had you know particular uh, sort of reach out to um, the LBTQ plus community that somebody would just say you know what we need to get to Elton John and he needs to support this so somehow we need to go a bit beyond that sort of, um, of thinking. Um, we've obviously got a rapidly changing demographic in the UK I mean I'm going to start from what we know now but we've got a new census coming out. And um, I suppose my own big learning from, or, or what I've been really reflecting on from this piece of work, which again is rather a simple thing, um, is that you know with so much of our audience work is on our audiences now, it can be quite tokenistic. You know, I see business plans from arts, culture and heritage organizations that will say something like, you know, we, we've got an um, objective to have one black person on our board or one disabled person, you know, horrible kind of tokenistic type stuff. But perhaps more importantly, we're not thinking about what our communities are gonna look like in 50 years to 100 years. And actually for our audience engagement to have any value, that's where we need to be zoning into, you know, not who our communities are, are now, but our long-term sort of trajectory for um, fundraising and philanthropy. We've obviously got heightened awareness um, through the 18 months we've just been through on community race, diversity, EDI agendas anyway, um, quite rightly. And we're not seeing much then reflected in fundraising and philanthropy work, as some of you have already mentioned. And COVID has exacerbated this need for all of us working in arts, culture and heritage to really demonstrate the relevance of our work, the urgency of our work. Um, and I think we're seeing from the funders much more of a commitment to what I'm calling localism and community. So, you know, how are we gonna get people back safely into our, our venues? Um, how are we going to respond to audiences that are now working very differently because they're not commuting into work and traveling so much? Um, and how can we demonstrate the, that we really truly understand um, our beneficiaries? So why are we prioritizing certain work over other areas of work? Um, because for sure, you know, we know from other major global disasters um, that we're likely to have a long tail for fundraising and philanthropy of between three and five years. So um, we're gonna be competing with health and education causes, um, for example, um, uh, for the next period in a very competitive uh, fundraising landscape. So this is some of our, our context that we've been looking at. And just very, I'm not gonna spend lots of time on it, but just to reflect on the, uh, the demographic picture. Um, it's rapidly changing, as we're all well aware of. So mid-2019, population of the UK are 66.8 million. And migration it has been the main driver of that growth, certainly since the 1990s. Um, we're going to have an additional 7.5 million people aged 65 years and over in the UK in 50 years' time. So much uh, kind of larger... Uh, pressures, if you like, on elderly care, old age, social care, as we're hearing so much 
um, from politicians at the moment. So like, you know, life expectancy um, uh, really, really changing and um, we're expected to live uh, a little bit longer, uh, all being well. <laughs> um, our migration figures, even with um, Brexit, um, continue to uh, hold up. So um, we're adding, uh, or we added in the last period, 313,000 people um, who intended to stay for 12 months or more. Um, so more than left. Um, and, you know, Brexit's having some effect, but not so much to make this trajectory uh, change. Um, growing population, as I've already uh, mentioned, um, and then another big trend, um, that again, we hear a lot in the media about more people uh, living alone. Um, so all these things really going to affect our uh, audience uh, development, our thinking about audiences. Um, but certainly in my own practice, I don't see a lot of organisations focusing on the long term uh, demographics. We're usually focused on the, the, the sort of here and now. Um, so number of people over 85 living on their own expected to grow. Uh, to 1.4 million um, from just over half a million in the next period. Population more diverse. Um, so uh, by 2031, um, ethnic populations make up 15% of the population in England, 37% of the population in London. Um, and not only impacts of migration, but different fertility rates, different um, uh, sort of attitudes, if you like, to having families and the size of families. Um, and uh, that's obviously also going to have a big um, impact on health and social care and that sort of uh, provision, um, because then we have different sort of prevalence of disease in, in different types of, of, of population. Um, but for those of us um, working in heritage organisations in in London, um, obviously the, the need to, um, to change and adapt and to uh, look at fundraising and differently for different communities um, is obviously an enormous driver, but so is it in other parts of the country. Um, so the census, you know, we, it won't be too long before we have the updated uh, census uh, uh, figures. Um, but, you know, for the, the current census, we've got about 80% of the population white British, um, and then Asian groups making up about 6.8%, Black 3.4%, etc. But, you know, if we compare this to the census that is about to, um, to, to, to fall and that we'll, we'll get a copy of, um, we're going to have seen a rapid change in these figures um, on ethnicity. Um, and again, uh, in terms of sort of geographic um, uh, concentration of, of different uh, communities, um, we see uh, larger figures in London, as we might expect, uh, Northwest, West Midlands, etc. But um, if we look at uh, research that's also been done um, in terms of uh, the impact of Brexit and also um, changing uh, communities, then um, by 2061, we're going to see um, increases right across the UK, uh, particularly high increases for those local authorities uh, bordering the largest cities. Um, so big changes um, uh, that are obviously going to impact on all of our uh, audience development uh, strategies. Sexuality, um, we're uh, obviously you know, relatively sort of stable in terms of the, the demographic information that we have, um, but lots more um, uh, sort of younger people um, feeling more confident um, to identify um, as gay, lesbian, gay or bisexual. Um, and, you know, communities that we need to be thinking about very clearly in terms of programming and, and content um, and engagement as well. Um, and then we've got other aspects of uh, behaviours and uh, sort of age brackets. So um, this particular research comes from Experian. Um, so our millennials um, that we hear so much about, the oldest millennials are actually 37 years old now. So um, uh, uh, approaching uh, middle age, so starting their own families, moving to more senior positions, 
Um, and there's still this trend of them then moving away from traditional models of salaried employment. So more than a fifth of millennials um, have changed jobs, <coughs> et cetera, in the last uh, 12 months, which is more than three times the number of other age groups. So we're seeing much more uh, self-employment and also uh, moving from job to job more quickly as big trends. Um, and again, for those of us who are then trying to build relationships, perhaps with particular corporates, uh, where we're trying to build relationships with individuals working in those, um, in those companies, then um, this can have a very uh, big and real impact um, in our ability or not to be able to build uh, relationships with uh, people working for particular companies. Um, and then on the other sort of side of the scale, we've got the next 30 years or so, there's a kind of window if you like, of opportunity um, for the baby boomer generation. So people born um, from 1946 to 1964 who have um, benefited, <coughs> or some people uh, um, as part of uh, that, those age categories have benefited from um, inheriting property, for example, that has escalated in value. So this is why at the moment there's such emphasis in the charity sector on legacy giving because for the next 30 years, we've got this generation coming through um, uh, who have inherited wealth. And it's a 30 year window um, because sadly the generations um, coming up behind that, uh, including myself, are not gonna benefit in the same way that the baby boomers um, did from, uh, uh, from those sort of things. Um, and then in religion, again, we're going to see um, an awful lot of change in the upcoming um, census. So we had uh, Christianity um, as 59.3% uh, of the population, um, and then the next highest uh, figures um, around uh, Muslim populations um, or not stated. So um, again, huge changes. Um, uh, in uh, particularly um, one of my uh, colleagues, Naeem Razra, we're working a lot on in terms of fundraising for arts uh, communities from the Muslim population because of the growing demographic and also their propensity to give to charity, uh, just not perhaps so much into <laughs> the arts sector um, because at the moment we're not geared up for that sort of fundraising uh, so well from the arts sector. And then disability um, as a sort of final overview of, of, of this. So 7.7 .7 million people of working age um, uh, reported uh, a disability in uh, at this particular period in 2020. So 19% of the working age population, uh, which is kind of extraordinary. Um, and again, has so much of a uh, impact on how we think about um, engagement outreach as well as our own workforces uh, within arts, culture and heritage. Um, and then there's some, you know, kind of heartbreaking uh, statistics as well, um, like this one, almost a third of 18 to 35 year olds with learning disabilities spend less than one hour a day outside their home, according to SCOPE. Um, so again, in terms of the Arts Council England drivers and Let's Create, um, and uh, the sort of things that we are going to need to uh, be responding to with real authenticity in our next funding uh, uh, agreements. Um, these things are, are, are very real drivers. And mentioning, let's create, um, this is a, a, a quote on relevance and engagement from their director of uh, diversity. Um, so, um, they're being pretty gung-ho at the moment. You know, if, if organisations fail to meet targets, they will lose funding. Uh, whether we really will see that in, uh, in practice, uh, we'll, we'll have to see. But that is what they're saying um, at the moment. So they're going to be judging organisations for the way in which they reflect and build a relationship with their communities, as well as um, obviously looking at the creative case for diversity. So this, again, from my perspective, shows the real driver that we're going to need to um, have and, and, and put in place to properly understand our communities and audiences, not right now, but in what are they going to look like in 50 to 100 years time? Because if we're going to have any chance at uh, sustaining um, those relationships, then um, it's that longer term view that is going to make a real difference to, to what we put in place now, um, I think. 
any questions on that, any of that, or anything that people want to raise or, or observe before I go on to the philanthropic trends? Go down, aren't there? You know, we can go down um, uh, a, a particular sort of uh, religious community, or we can go down a particular uh, demographic community, or we can go down a particular age-based community. Um, and I think much like in fundraising practice, um, organisations that tend to be most successful will focus on a couple of areas and do them brilliantly, as opposed to too much kind of uh, breadth um, across different audiences that then, it, it, I say, it feels a bit tokenistic or one-off, um, not embedded enough, um, and therefore can't have the impact that, that perhaps we would want to see. Um, so there's an awful lot for us to... To, to, to think think about. So just building on this a little bit um, more, the um, there's there's also moves out in philanthropy that are changing um, how we might approach things. So I, um, I kind of follow quite a lot what is happening in the US because we usually then see a sort of 10 to 15 year sort of delay and then we, we start to get some of these things really impacting our work in, in the UK. So um, we've got um, what I call a, a fix-it style philanthropy trend, <coughs> which is um, people like Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg, who um, with their vast wealth are setting up foundations that are to solve things. Um, so um, in Mark Zuckerberg's case, to, uh, he wants to eradicate all disease, I think is the global ambition. Um, um, for Bill Gates, you know, he's taken on things like, you know, he wants to eradicate malaria around the world in his lifetime, that, that sort of stuff. And this is having a huge impact on um, kind of general purpose grant making, because a lot of then next generation people are feeling that they need to limit themselves to one or two causes um, and focus on something that they can solve. And for arts, culture and heritage, um, we were usually part of a kind of wealthy person's portfolio because that was what they did. Um, and now we're seeing a move, certainly in the States, away from that because people are sort of linking into to causes where they can solve. And I think where I work with organisations, I'm sort of for, for major donors and philanthropic, I'm saying, you know, present something that can be um, solved, you know, through this gift. Um, so it might be something organisationally that really needs to change and that will make a real difference for the future. Um, but sometimes, you know, we don't always want to be thinking in that way because it's rather exhausting and it's not necessarily what we want to do as, as core purpose for our arts, culture and heritage organisations. And we can also see this trend very clearly in the foundations that have been set up in recent years. So, in um, the foundations we know really well, like the Paul Hamlin Foundation, Leslie Fairbairn, um, they were all set up within 10 years of each other in the 1960s to 70s, um, because at that time there was a trend that wealthy people set up general purpose grant makers, of which arts was usually a part. Um, but we haven't seen any set up in recent years, not of any real note. Um, I think the largest one I know about was a 60 million pound foundation that was set up by um, a, a, a Yorkshireman um, that does do a little bit of arts fundraising, but we haven't seen um, art support, sorry, we, we haven't seen any general purposes foundations in recent years. So that's a concern because obviously then we're limited to the funds that already sit within those foundations that support the arts. And on COVID, um, this is a statistic that comes from the, the Beacon Philanthropy Research. Um, there was a, you know, whilst we're expecting a long tail on fundraising, <coughs> there was an increase um, on uh, the amount of money donated uh, to charitable causes by high net worth individuals, but the donations were relatively small in the last year. So median donations each quarter of 200 pounds um, it actually was more in September and then less in December, and the younger age group, 18 to 40, 34, gave more and more quickly. So again, this has you know huge implications. Um, what do we put in place for the for the future? How are we going to engage with people? You know, who should we go to? Do we go to our traditional art supporters, or do we try and build currency with with younger people? Um, so some of our, our themes emerging um, from this um, are quite straightforward, but obviously hard to implement in, in practice. 
Um, we need this long-term process of understanding how communities are changing and likely to change one-off activities to engage a particular group or demographic are obviously very limited in scope. Um, there's no homogeneity um, because individuals are human beings. So um, we can't say this is how you engage with the Muslim community or this is how you engage with X community um, because obviously there are differences um, in, in approach uh, depending on who you're talking to. Having said that, there are some things that are running through um, that are kind of more, more, more standard and generalized, which I'll, I'll share after the break. Um, wealth is only one factor. Um, uh, it's a complex set of issues that we're dealing with when trying to fundraise from diverse communities, including culture and engagement. And as a sector, you know, I think um, pretty fair to say uh, with some exceptions, that we're at the start of this work so we need learning and reflective processes where we can all learn what works and what what doesn't work um, uh, when we try and uh, kind of diversify fundraising in this way so i've got a few uh, short case studies um, and do do stop me um, and then we can discuss um, uh, at the end so on um lgbtq plus um there has been some really good work with from major institutions and indeed smaller institutions. I've pulled out um, some of these examples from um, the, the larger institutions. So um, Royal Opera House had a new opera set in a gay bar in 2016, um, partnerships with Stonewall and um, good engagement, but it was a bit of a one-off type activity. National Portrait Gallery um, has its iconic exhibition um, celebrating gay icons and again, you know, good family outreach. Um, and uh, the Tate, uh, so they had the queer British art exhibition in 2017 um, and they supported, they set up a queer British art exhibition supporter circle. Um, but again, it seemed as if that was a kind of one off activity around that particular exhibition. But it was quite interesting in terms of. The philanthropic engagement that they um, try to put in place. Um, so every few years there are kind of very large scale um, initiatives in this in this way, um, but nothing really that looks as if it's um, uh, sustained. Um, apart from, of course, um, <laughs> the Museum of London um, and uh, the, this real drive. Um, to be able to um, uh, look at uh, uh, different audiences and engagement in this area um, around the collection. Um, I don't know, Anthony, if you were happy to, to talk to any of the things that have been done at Museum of London in this area or not? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't have much involvement in this. We don't particularly have any kind of fundraising um, against any of these. They just make up our full quota of um, interesting things that we uh, use as kind of topical things that run throughout the year. Um, our, our kind of primary focus is, is the new museum and, and I agree that this is important and we are going to have, um, well, we're just developing an engagement strategy actually for our learning team who are focusing on, you know, those underrepresented voices um, and making sure that they are heard and their stories are told in the new museum. So when people come along, they kind of feel that sense of identity and belonging and welcome in those spaces. So, um, and that's all communities. And we are making sure that, you know, our stories reflect Londoners from the past and the present, but those who are from different communities and the communities that you've mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, this was a, a great initiative. We did it this year as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I agree it's important and it is very much embedded within our, our organisation, particularly the LGBTQ plus stuff. Um, Do you think it's been really helpful that it's it's regular, um, you know, that it's coming back regularly in terms of programming yeah. and emphasis? It's been driven by um, our network, actually, who are really, really behind this and have in the last I think they set up about two or three years ago now. But, um, but yeah, this is that, that's the main driver is their involvement and, and making sure that their, their voices are heard within the museum. And then it goes external as well, not just internally. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thanks to our, our LGBTQ plus network for really kind of driving that forward. 
Yeah. So again, that's a sort of great example, isn't it, of it coming kind of up, upwards, if you like, from the community for the organisation to implement rather than the mm. organisation itself trying to, to uh, mm. uh, decide what happens. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and then for a sort of example of a smaller uh, arts organisation, so Stratford Circus Arts, they have this lovely intergenerational engagement project called Story of My Life, so shared storytelling project and um, brings members of Muslim community, so it's a third of the Muslim population, into an arts venue for the first time, but they have this reciprocal thing where also local res residents are given a chance to visit the local mosque. Um, so kind of quite simple uh, engagement, but again, really important in terms of its sustained uh, nature. So that long-term relationship building. Um, the Desi uh, pubs, um, which I really like um, from a visual arts uh, initiative. So um, uh, Midlands based, uh, bringing a classic English pub uh, together with um, Punjabi food and, and Bangra. And there's been this wonderful um, artist endeavor um, developing uh, portraits, stained glass windows, photography and mosaics, et cetera. Again, which has a long-term um, nature of it um, and feels like a genuine sort of uh, co-collaboration. Um, so bringing together, again, storytelling, so archives, broadcasts and publication, which is a real um, a sort of strand running through the, through the work. Um, and then on um, other particular communities that we've focused on in the research, so um, Indian diaspora, um, uh, kind of a quote from um, Shushma Jansari, the British Museum uh, curator, um, so, you know, she talks about um, her role as sort of, you know, being one of the only uh, curators from um, Indian origin, uh, looking at that collection and obviously talking about the cultural barriers in terms of the expectation of, um, uh, from her, her, her parents and other parents in those communities of uh, going into accountancy or, 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 or dentistry or, or uh, medicine, um, etc. So she talks about there being the real potential for diaspora philanthropy, um, but that there isn't at the moment strong networks that can encourage people to get involved. So to share experiences coming together uh, to get involved. And we have seen, and the research has shown similar things from the, the Sikh community and Sikh uh, philanthropy, um, we haven't at the moment got that sort of groundswell of communities coming together to support um, different initiatives. And um, again, from the States, there's um, something called the Seek Art and Film Foundation, which has an annual leadership summit um, uh, called Doing Well by Doing Good. And so they link questions of leadership um, in its most general sense and social impact with this art and film um, foundation. And they've got real major backing from um, uh, different corporates, but also it is a group and community then where seek major donors come together and feel that they're collectively working together to uh, be able to make um, impact. And this really brings us to um, giving circles. And I'll just go through um, some of the things that we've explored in giving circles, but... Um, uh, again, when I started, it was right at the start of this uh, piece of research, we were seeing from the States um, wonderful examples um, there in Philadelphia, there's um, a, a movement called Black Giving Circles, um, focused not on art sector, but on um, community and, and charity and issues like poverty, etc. But where we have seen real change and engagement in uh, bringing people who might not otherwise uh, want to support charities into feeling that they can be really empowered to get involved. So the, the nature of this is very simple. Um, they're looking to solve needs and problems in their own communities. Um, they're bringing uh, people together that have a, a vision um, and that can make change and importantly can give. Sometimes not large amounts of money, relatively small amounts of money, but what seems to make a real difference is that they're working together as a, a collective. <coughs> So a couple of other um, examples of this, we um, sort of different types of, 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 uh, of circles 
Um, we've got the Circles of Art in Suffolk, um, so set up in 2017, and um, provides smaller amounts of money to uh, smaller museums and galleries. Um, there's a £200 membership fee. Um, and again, it's a group of people who are interested in the local community who are then uh, putting money back in smaller uh, museums and galleries. Um, right through to the something like the British Red Cross Tiffany Circle, um, more of a major donor uh, drive because there's a £5,000 minimum donation, um, but that is completely women-led um, circle. Um, the members get to choose which projects they want to support, um, and they can actively get involved participating in uh, workshops, sitting on panels. Um, and there are 900 members of that, and it's a truly global uh, network. So also quite um, an interesting model. But, you know, again, with all of these, we're seeing um, the drive needs to come from um, empowerment, you know, being able to genuinely make things happen. It's a bit like a micro version of the, the Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg's type model of, you know, we're going to take something that means a lot in our local community and, and work together to, uh, to solve it. So I was going to um, uh, pause there. I mean, I would say that out of, um, in terms of stepping in to this area, that giving circles seem to be um, uh, a really kind of natural and comfortable way to start. So I'm going to give some examples of that again um, after the break. To think about how we actually might do this, um, and I'm, a lot of the recommendations are drawn from the donors of Colour Network, um, and they sound very basic and perhaps a little bit preachy in places, so forgive me uh, for that, but I suppose I wanted to reflect on, whilst they sound quite obvious, um, just how difficult it can sometimes be doing these very simple things well within our, our, our organisations for, for lots of different reasons. Um, of you know leadership and barriers to doing them and, and competing priorities. So um, uh, I've got seven sort of different areas uh, to look at. So our um, drivers for this work in the first place is um, that we're looking at our long-term communities and therefore our priorities. Um, we obviously want to explore our wider artistic cultural heritage aspirations and make better sense of our collection or set of artistic projects. In terms of our communication to funders right now, um, it's an important part of our relevance and urgency case. So that post-COVID uh, driver of why we should be supported as opposed to um, another organization. I think um, whilst organizations will often have multiple audience priorities in fundraising, um, and certainly from all the people that we've talked to in this, work we've got to build long-term relationships for the future so overstretching on who we're trying to reach is unlikely to work even if we're in a team uh, with large resources um, so really we're picking one or two uh, communities and really trying to build depth and, and understanding so whilst the audience picture might change rapidly within our organization I think the fundraising um, audience for diverse communities. If we're going to be able to make any impact at all, uh, we need to really focus and say, you know, the, these are the audiences that we're, we're looking at for the next sort of five to 10 years. Um, <clears throat> so on uh, uh, leadership, um, this is a, a quote from uh, the co-founder of, of Donors of, of Colour Network, and it starts with board. And again, we all know this and it's so obvious, but this is a key area where it can be incredibly difficult to influence our organizations. So if the board and teams, why you're not throwing the right party, she says to attract donors of colors, too often a disconnect between the donor, uh, the, the organization and its uh, community. And she also goes on to say that, you know, superficial changes people pick up in an instance and can be um, incredibly patronizing and, and quite irritating. Um, so, you know, we've got to look at board and workforce and, uh, as she says, do the real work. Um, and I think for some of us working internally in organisations, this can be incredibly frustrating because we know it, we want to make change. Um, but often these things are not within our, 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 our control to be able to impact. Um, so thinking about leadership, again, the donors of colour network. Um, I think this can sound a little bit uh, patronising, but it sort of makes sense that 
Um, if we're in recruiting employees or trustees that perhaps do it in clusters of people, you know, again, prevent tokenism. Um, we want a supportive network uh, for, for these individuals. Um, at the moment, we're recruiting to a, a diverse fellowship and apprentices. Um, and we're working with a group of Northwest based organizations because we're very aware of that support network that needs to be in place. So if we can work with organizations that are relatively near to each other um, in Manchester and Liverpool, for, for example, then we've got a chance to have that longer term built in support uh, network. Um, they talk about surveying employees, you know, if we're not comfortable about the strength of EDI in the organization, then it might not be the right time to focus on diverse <coughs> supporters and that integrity of the relationship is all important. Um, and we're obviously aware of, you know, some of the particularly in larger institutions, there's some, you know, very difficult conversations and um, uh, challenging stuff in the media um, around EDI um, and, you know, all things that we obviously need to, to be aware of and take account of. Um, so not optics, but real cultural uh, competency. Um, the language is, um, and I'll kind of come back to communications again in a, in a moment, um, again, very obvious uh, to say, but we've got to be very careful with our use of language. <laughs> in um, my organisation, Cause4, we've worked with a couple of um, uh, EDI experts uh, this year to review all our language that we're putting out, actually, and it's been transformative because sometimes we can think that we've got the best awareness in the world, and in fact, we're putting out something um, that is not uh, making sense. So, you know, particular terms can be very loaded, like the use of the word justice, for example, um, <clears throat> and therefore, you know, we need to invest and sense check these things all the time and to keep doing it. Um, allyship, quite important, you know, who in the organisation is going to be supportive of this agenda, who's going to be able to help, who is going to be able to influence if the organisation is not uh, fully bought into it. So who's going to help amplify the voice and the message? Any reflections on, on those things before I, I move on from anybody? It can be very frustrating <clears throat> when we know some of the, these things, but as I say, I'm not in a position to necessarily influence. In terms of the, the learning aspect, um, ideally we want to join up the focus, you know, what's the focus going, that's going to make most sense across the organisation, um, not only obviously for, for fundraising, but for future artistic or curatorial uh, direction. Um, and one of my colleagues described this as a decade of small steps, and I rather like that, you know, this feeling that we were biting off small chunks of the elephant, as it were, um, to be able to um, do things differently in, in these areas. So we need a, a plan, um, and certainly um, there are obviously a, va a vast array of different types of organisations represented today, but uh, for those of us perhaps in more hierarchical sort of team-based organisations, um, I think for fundraising, we want to be clear, you know, this is the community that we're focusing on and this is where we're putting the, the effort for the long term, because these kind of one-off initiatives can be great, you know, in the media for a period of time, but they're not going to obviously sustain a long-term fundraising relationship with, uh, with donors. And then there's this um, kind of honest dialogue, um, 2020, 2021, um, we've been through uh, an awful lot, and, you know, not just COVID, obviously, but um, George Floyd and Black Lives Matters and environmental debates and all those things of kind of hitting all and coming to the fore all at the same time. So it's a good time from the research that we've said just to say, you know, we haven't got this right, we're not good enough in this area, this is what we're trying to achieve and this is what support we'll need to be able to, uh, to do it and to commit to that kind of measurement aspect. Um, institutionalize the commitment, uh, you know, easy thing to say, very hard to do in, in practice. But again, I, if I was leading an internal fundraising team at the moment, I would definitely be saying, we're gonna start here and this is what we're gonna do for the, for the long term because it all takes time to build relationships as we, as we well know. Um, 
And then um, again, a different uh, example from a really interesting philanthropist, uh, Raj Azava. Um, I might make a first gift to a cause, even if it lacks diversity, but if I don't see more diversity amongst its leaders over time, I would stop giving. So, you know, we can be on a journey, but obviously we have to be authentic about that journey and, and they, uh, the donors will need to see some, some real change. Um, and then, um, as with lots of things, that learning aspect, that reflection aspect, um, uh, we need to be listening, you know, what are we not getting right, what did jarred in our communications, uh, what has the wrong uh, tone, um, and certainly the work I'm doing in this in this area, because two years ago it was kind of a completely new area for, for me, um, and still continues to be, um, I'm for sure talking to people who are actually uh, doing it, you know, people like Naeem, who um, for years has uh, worked on charity fundraising from uh, uh, Muslim donors, because, um, uh, you know, obviously we're just going to need to keep keep learning and we will make mistakes. Um, and so sort of challenging uh, those assumptions and uh, you know, not making generalizations about people's giving capacity based solely on income and wealth, because certainly in terms of different uh, communities, there are going to be wider factors, um, cultural ones, family ones, education ones, uh, as opposed to, uh, to just money. In terms of opportunity, this comes back to the, a bit of the conversation uh, we started to have on, um, on giving circles. Um, so uh, again, these are quite big generalizations, but we can see them in the trends. So wealthy people of color are more likely than their white counterparts to have earned their wealth rather than inherited it. So, um, so sweeping generalization, um, but this comes from the donors of color networks. So there is that more entrepreneurial aspect. Um, you know, people that have um, kind of made their own wealth um, are going to be different uh, proposition than people that maybe come into inherited wealth in terms of philanthropic engagement. So uh, in our language, we're thinking of advancing community, we're thinking of um, uh, opportunity, we're thinking of conversations, we're thinking again, perhaps in micro terms of the Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg thing of what solutions are we trying to create for, for the problems uh, that we have within our organizations. You know, we want to uh, be able to convey that uh, a philanthropic relationship with our organization will lead to some, uh, some change. Um, and also that we're not necessarily competing just with other charities. Um, again, in some cultures, we're competing with uh, family members um, uh, etc. For uh, for donations, um, so we're wanting to emphasise uh, creating opportunities for people, you know, friends and family, and therefore, again, we need to be authentic because those opportunities need to be real and they need to be there for the long term, not just something that's tokenistic around a particular exhibition uh, or, or particular opportunity. On the ambassadors front, I mean, again, I think um, Anthony said this kind of brilliantly in your uh, very ambitious uh, giving circle, um, this can make a real difference because obviously you want people who will bring other people ideally. Um, and we also have to be very aware of the risks if we uh, mishandle a relationship um, that word uh, can spread very quickly. Um, so again, uh, I'm sort of slightly repeating myself, but it, I can't emphasize it enough, long-term commitment, um, long-term game, not a short-term uh, game, because donors are, are alive, as we all are, to this sort of uh, tokenistic uh, uh, commitment. So much better to go for one thing than to try and say we're going to try and reach five or six new audiences in our, in our fundraising. And then the research, I mean, it goes without saying, we would hope want to do good research, um, but we're going to uh, need to <laughs> zone in in quite a different way in where particular communities might gather, you know, for example, places of work, worship, which is what the Stratford Circus have done so effectively uh, with some of their uh, communities. Then on uh, trust, um, so, uh, like with any donor, we're wanting to show we're generally interested in culture, so we need to build our awareness. Um, I think we can be forgiven a lot if we're 
uh, making mistakes, as long as we're learning and not making the same mistakes, um, that we're aware of um, upcoming dates that are important to local people and display cultural sensitivity. And, you know, I've, I find, found it myself, I've, I've done some um, uh, kind of joint presenting with um, fundraisers, specialists in, in different uh, communities. And I found myself before a, um, a, a training session before Easter saying, you know, have a good Easter to delegates. I'm just thinking that wasn't a, a particularly a good thing to do. So, you know, we've got to obviously be, be thinking much wider. Um, and like in any good fundraising, but particularly uh, perhaps as we're starting to engage with new audiences, that we're showing up front how the gift will be used and we're definitely communicating how the, diff the gift, gift has been uh, used subsequently to it having been made. Um, so again, from this sort of more entrepreneurial uh, stance, um, uh, the donors of colour networks has known the value of a hard earned pound. Um, and again, that might just sound so obvious, but I think if you are a self-made uh, entrepreneur, you definitely think about money uh, differently from somebody who may have inherited wealth. Um, and then uh, we have the, uh, again, which we can only build through knowledge and actually doing it, but um, these are again some, some sort of generalizations, but um, what we see in the philanthropic giving with uh, particular communities um, are some quite sort of important features. Um, and again, it will um, really affect what time we put in and who, uh, who does the ask and those sort of things. So um, for the Hispanic community in the US in particular, um, then um, they'll want longer and more frequent visits to get to know you. So, you know, very relational based, very friendly. Um, it's going to take time. Um, again, my colleague Naeem in the Muslim community, he will just say, you know, they've got no time for our, uh, our UK kind of faff um, of carefully building, um, uh, you know, trust and having two or three meetings or whatever. He's just like, he's right in there making an ask in the first meeting because that is culturally what is expected. Um, you know, in, in general, the, the major donors in his uh, network don't want him wasting their time. So it's like, make and ask and they'll say yes or no. Um, so the all things we obviously have to learn. Um, the Indian and American donors, much more multi-generational. Um, so uh, much more sort of family orientated decision-making. So we've got to work out how we engage with children and spouses and. Uh, uh, older members of the family um, and get them connected to the to the cause. Um, so all this is going to require us um, one to be talking to as many people as possible, but obviously to uh, be stimulating conversations about um, engagement. Okay, and then um, on communications, um, again quite straightforward stuff, but things that we can make mistakes on in our organizations, sometimes without even necessarily realizing it. So um, when uh, we're gathering demographic information, you know, we need to be thinking and asking questions about race and ethnicity in a sensitive way, um, allow people to self-identify because people don't like to be put in boxes. Um, we uh, want to be uh, careful about uh, nationality and religious affiliation. Um, uh, in terms of what we're asking for and very simple things where we see you know kind of um, huge mistakes made if you like uh, like listing multiple choice options in a way that doesn't promote a hierarchy um, so that you uh, it might be in alphabetical order for for example um, and then we're allowing people to opt out of answering particular questions or to write in their own responses. And I'll copy, um, and again, so I think I, I felt real value from having two or three go-to people who can sense check and copy, particularly if we're trying to reach particular audiences that we don't have good expertise in reaching, uh, that we're making sure commas are inclusive and welcoming, we're getting feedback, there's no tick box type diversity, um, and that we're using language and labels uh, carefully. Uh, so, you know, for example, people uh, often like to be identified by their country of origin rather than a broader uh, term. So, um, you know, again, our whole organisational 
um, uh, sort of approach to whether we're using terms like BAME or those sort of things are, 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 are really important. And that we've got these points of connection. So um, images, we're touching on common shared values and uh, like family, um, that we're kind of aware of particular methods of communication um, that are much more popular in certain communities than, than others, like cable television, for example, particularly uh, with some uh, religious communities. Um, and that we're living and breathing our uh, non-discrimination policies. And again, this is areas that we know are so important, but that a lot of organizations, particularly in the way social media and particularly Twitter is being utilized at the moment are being called out on having a disconnect between uh, what their policy says and what they're uh, actually doing. Life benefits. Um, uh, I mean, this is so kind of um, uh, common within any uh, philanthropy that we're, we're, we're doing. So we want to really clearly communicate how what you're asking for is going to support people um, that you're trying to connect with and their families, um, et cetera. So, uh, you know, obviously, if you're seeking to engage black donors around a health, a health issue uh, that shows how the disease affects black women in comparison with other demographics, then we need to be absolutely clear about it. Um, so again, no tokenism. Um, and uh, we'll want to be very clear about why diverse donors should give now, which again, is why I think that our starting point is one or two communities in our fundraising and making it clear that this is a commitment for the for the longer term, because otherwise it's just probably not worth even getting started. So what's important <coughs> philanthropically, what do they hope to achieve with their giving? How would you like to contribute to our mission? Which other causes have you supported? Why did you give, et cetera? So all things that we would ask in normal philanthropic uh, relationships, but we need to build a picture um, and as I say, make sure um, it's for the longer term. And to have that sense of, you know, allyship, people um, that will work with you so that you can try things and, that, and, and, and refine them. And then um, as with any, again, any philanthropy, people are more likely to give if they feel an emotional connection to the recipient. Uh, diverse donors like any of us will have uh, diverse uh, ideas. So um, we need to give opportunities for people to leverage their knowledge and experience, which is what we are just starting to touch on before the break in terms of giving circles. So, you know, there's a sort of very different dynamic between being involved in a group where the organisation knows what it wants to achieve and creating a group where that group has some say over what it's going to um, achieve. <clears throat> Uh, we all want to feel understood and we need that sense of collaboration, particularly if we're uh, trying to reach audiences for the for the first time. Um, so these are all things that we need to grapple with. Um, and again, um, with uh, few resources and uh, capacity being difficult in fundraising teams, then, you know, one or two areas is, is likely to have traction rather than spreading too, too thinly. Um, and then our um, commitment to particular community events, again, for the, for the longer term. Um, and, uh, you know, if there's a kind of cross-cultural connection um, in, the, uh, in Birmingham every year, there's a um, pantomime, there's a Christmas-themed pantomime um, solely for people from the Muslim community, which works just a treat, you know, in terms of that sort of cross uh, fertilization of ideas and, and culture. Um, but again, it just can't be one off. We need to, if we're going to go down that route, then we need to be committed to it uh, for the longer term and work out what in our program is going to uh, is going to work. Um, so, um, you know, some organizations are making really good connections by partnering with other uh, charities or membership organizations um, where they can support them to reach particular uh, communities because those are the communities that they, they specialize in. So for sure, the kind of partnership model um, is gonna be uh, very helpful. So intentional, uh, long-term and uh, deliberate um, with a heap of um, learning um, along the way, because uh, for sure, 
uh, we will make uh, mistakes and some things will not chime and we need to be, uh, uh, be ready for that. But so much of this, of course, is the hallmarks of, um, of traditional good practice in fundraising. So we'll want to have done good research, we'll want to cultivate the right networks, we'll want a partnership mindset, it will need to be for the uh, longer term, um, we'll want to be demonstrating kindness, uh, respect and sensitivity. Um, and to make sure that it doesn't feel tokenistic, but uh, for the longer term. Um, so, you know, again, deciding on which areas we're going to, to focus on, uh, so important. Right. I was going to go on to uh, just think about the different types of giving circles, and then we've got a moment to um, consider a particular uh, scenario. So the... Um, Giving circle models, so we're, we're reaching out, uh, you know, with this message of, can you help? Um, uh, great starting point, as already mentioned, in working with diverse donors. And in fact, in all the various things that we've researched as, as part of this work, uh, diverse donors seem uh, uh, one, one of the, the kind of easiest routes in. So we're looking at a funding pool. We're looking at creating a group. Um, that group then has some say in um, what it's contributing to. Um, uh, and what types of uh, community projects. So uh, Jessica Baer describes it as a cross between a book club and an investment group, rather nice. Um, Angela Aikenberry, they pool and give away personal resources, educate and engage members, provide a social dimension for their members and are independent of any formal body. Um, <clears throat> there's quite a lot in there, isn't it? You know, we're asking people to contribute as volunteers, we're asking for that engagement, um, um, and we're asking for, uh, we need to make sure that those groups have a social dimension, and that it's fun to be, be part of them, and that people feel that they can genuinely make things uh, happen. In terms of uh, UK versus US, um, we're seeing kind of network philanthropy anyway coming into the focus in the UK, particularly uh, because of the last 18 months that we've, uh, uh, we've had. So um, lots of sort of community engagement around food banks, for example, um, started in 2014, only had 200 branches, now over 2000 nationwide. Um, that whole Trussell Trust Network that established the initial food banks um, is a Christian initiative, um, but now supported by volunteers and other faiths as well. Um, so, um, you know, kind of much broader uh, development of um, uh, faith allegiance. So I think, um, I suppose what this is saying is that we've got kind of the fertile um, seeds of um, putting in place some of this, uh, this endeavor. Um, and certainly in the charity sector, that grassroots upwards sort of element is an um, important uh, part of the concept. So we've got three different kind of models for this. So we've got um, self-initiated. <laughs> um, so it might be small groups of friends um, who meet somewhere um, in London, growing number of giving networks, um, some independent of uh, companies in the city. Um, we've also got like young philanthropists, uh, networks, um, and quite a lot of arts organizations are linked in to some of those groups. Um, you've then got uh, facilitated giving circles. So might be facilitated by an overarching body such as Beyond Me or the community foundations, which help people to establish a circle, set goals and connect them to uh, causes. And there is one um, group um, that we're involved in at the moment uh, called Black Giving, uh, Black Giving to the Arts, I think it is, uh, which is exactly that. So facilitated uh, giving circle, um, bringing together a group of um, Black philanthropists um, to get them involved in a number of different arts causes. And then the institutional giving circle, circles, um, so usually uh, facilitated by people well-established, and run by um, uh, organizations as part of their giving ladder or what the organization wants to, to achieve. So we've got three different uh, types and what we've discovered through the research on divert, the research on diverse uh, communities is that the self um, initiated is 
starting to have sort of some traction in being able to engage with audiences that organizations wouldn't otherwise have um, have support to do. So we've got a kind of variety of uh, dimensions. Uh, we're thinking about uh, social interaction, social bonds, intellectual stimulation, satisfaction, opportunity to learn, a shared philanthropic experience, um, and there's a sense of a sort of empowerment. And uh, we know that this has a, a profound impact on someone's values and behaviors. And um, also, you know, our kind of big motivator can be if um, a group's activities could have their, their fundraising matched, for example. Um, so something that um, Arts Council England is exploring as a new uh, sort of um, uh, impetus to be able to uh, stimulate more uh, giving circles. So it doesn't have to be at the very high end, it can be at the lower end of giving. In fact, that would probably be our, our step in, certainly in terms of uh, access. Um, and, uh, you know, it'd be interesting to see um, as part of the development of this research and how we think about populations and audiences um, as to whether we can really uh, stimulate um, uh, more giving circles in this sort of area. Okay, I'm going to come back to giving circles in uh, in just a moment. But um, to be able to do this, um, we're going to need some peer support. Um, we're ourselves through arts fundraising philanthropy going to um, establish some networks. But what support in your organisations do you think you would need um, to really effectively be able to reach out to communities that you've maybe had had in mind for a while? Obviously, you need the support of the, the institution or the organization, but what else would help? <laughs> I'm just thinking on top of my head um, that if um, if my my area there's a um, is a big Islamic community, and if I was looking to engage my local community and as a um, white middle class woman, I'd I would feel completely inept at doing that and I think the best person to do is to seek advice from that community and people um how is, is there some examples of where organizations have worked with their local communities to get the ideas to then go further and do things like giving circles I I think there definitely are pre I yeah. must feel that we need to do some pre-work before you even start working on the giving circles or things like that well for sure we, we need to know the context and what would would work um so Mandy's saying the local community as well and organizations such as rotary club um and i i agree with you it can feel really on or inauthentic and very awkward if we're just kind of reaching out and um without that initial research being being done um or, you know, are you the right person at all? It, it, you know, it, it is, I think, what you're saying. Not you personally, but any of us. A any thoughts on how we get that local community engagement? Who would do that? I mean, we can have ambassadors or group of people who would help us do that. Um, certainly using that quite a lot at the moment in sort of various West Midlands communities. Um, so, you know, there's a kind of interface between fundraising organization and, and local community that can work really well. Um, you know, two or three trustees, if there's organizations really seriously committed to this area of work can make a real a difference if they're um, embedded in particular communities. Local councillors, yeah, could be, could be in terms of those, those, those visits or that outright outreach. Thank you, Mandy. So what can I uh, do in my context right now? You know, in your organisations, from everything that we've sort of covered and the overview, what is going to work for your organisations was my first, uh, my first question, or where, where might you start? Which, which communities or audiences are going to be the right place to start? And then how might you, you engage them? Um, so with the, the New Museum project, we are, um, as I mentioned before, telling the story of underrepresented voices. I think if we could 
uh, group them up and have kind of various themes that we could um, take to people to say, you know, it could be a, a pride partner or, you know, a learning partner for a specific um, religion or ethnic group um, and how those stories are going to be told through the objects that we're going to share. Um, we could start to build a narrative that would apply to them and their community. Um, mm -hmm. And then that would appeal to them directly. Um, and then we could ask them for support in those areas. Um, how we would go about that, I'm not sure. I think the use of, to, to answer the, your previous question, I think the use of senior volunteers and ambassadors would be probably the most successful route, I think. Um, but we're also, because we've got a faith space within the new museum, we will have. Um, we're working with different faith leaders um, across the six main religions around the world. And we could start there, you know, we, we're interacting with them, we're engaging with them to make sure that the stories that we're telling are correct and um, valued by those communities. So why don't we start there in terms of, you know, talking to them about who they might know who can help us uh, make yeah. sure the narrative correct and then who we can fundraise from. I think that's brilliant. Um, and you've got a real relevance because of the, <laughs> excuse me, the space in the new museum and therefore authenticity and why you're doing. I mean, I think in your context, the um, uh, just the vast array of audiences make it difficult to know where to put the emphasis for fundraising, doesn't it? Um, because, you know, in terms of the collection, you're obviously trying to uh, demonstrate the wide reach that it has. But I think, you know, again, I mean, I've said it two or three times, I, I just, I, I can't see that approach to fundraising works because, it, you know, you're then to spread too thinly in terms of really trying to understand a different culture or engage for the longer term. Um, so I'm sort of quite interested in any of your strands of work, whether you saw a real particular link with one, you know, demographic, be it age, sexuality, disability or faith or, or whatever, um, where you, you know, you've got so much kind of rich content that it would be, there'd be that regularity of continuing to engage with people. Yeah, at the moment we're in the kind of private phase of the fundraising and that's all about big, large chunks of money initially. And uh, as we move closer to the public phase, I think that's when we'll have uh, the time and the resource um, to really separate those themes out. And we're only just really seeing the kind of content being delivered for the museum so we can understand what stories are gonna be told. Um, so I think that is definitely something once we have a bit more time that we need to prioritise. But yeah, where do we start? What's, <laughs> what's the first one? Yeah. Uh, how do we make sure that we, um, don't, as you say, don't spread ourselves too thinly because we want to make sure that we're kind of delivering that authentic message. Um, yeah, the, the depth's there. Yeah. Thank you. And as we're saying, you know, do we need to target our own workforce trustee recruitment first before even getting into this, this work? I don't know if it's first or kind of alongside, but it's a good question. Um, because again, then, as fundraisers, do we have the potential to even influence that in the way that is going to make sense for what we might want to, to achieve? What do people think about that? Um, and again, with the wrestling that we are all doing with the EDI with our organisations, um, how do we approach that with then wanting to focus on a particular audience? And really got sort of wrestling with with governance and um, you know the ability to have sort of authenticity with particular audiences. I saw this week um, that Brunel Museum, so they're one of our small museums, are recruiting three trustees and they want two to be Southwark residents and from underrepresented groups. And I just thought that was, yeah. I thought that's, that's a good start, isn't it? To, to really start. A good start. start, exactly. You know, if the community is the focus, then obviously trustee members need to, <laughs> to come from that community and understand it, or some of them certainly do. Yeah. No, I, I noticed that that too. I thought that was uh, was really good. Uh, quite simple and straightforward, but, but definitely really good. Okay, so if we were then exploring a giving giving circle, where where would you start, um, and and why? Um, do you think a giving circle could work in your your context and your organisations of, of the of the more grassroots up kind, I mean, 